Yeah, no, no, thank you for this invite. And it's really an honor actually also to present uh, in front of that group. Um, I think I've seen sitting there like Professor Danny Lidis um, is, uh, I'm a big fan of him. Hi there. <laughs> No, like there's a lot of nice papers on equivalence and, and application of it coming out of, of this uh, grasp uh, uh, group, and that's yeah, just really nice. And uh, it, it's it's a, it's a pity I, I can't be there in, in in person, but I guess at uh, one of the next conferences, uh, please uh, reach out if you uh, come to uh, uh, iClear and ICML, the ones in uh, Vienna, so in Europe. So I'll definitely be there. Um, okay. Uh, let me minimize some of yeah okay uh you can see my title slide right yeah okay um yeah so actually we, we talked a little bit about this lecture series uh which i put on youtube this group i gave in deep learning and when i was recording this and uh analyzing well what's going on in the 3d equivalence uh world uh, and, and literature, I, I figured out that actually we don't necessarily need um, steerable group convolutions or like uh, this klebsch gordon uh, tensor field framework for 3D point clouds. Um, even though the theory is super interesting, I always felt like it's a bit hard to uh, get into. Um, and also computationally, it can be heavy. And I've been sort of raised in this mindset of well, template matching, uh, signal process, uh, using the regular group convolution viewpoint. And so ever since then, I had this project, well, this particular paper, um, which I worked on and off uh, on over the last two years. And then finally with Sharvi, uh, Vatka, Rob Essling, Putri, and David, uh, PhD students in my team, we finally pushed this uh, to a paper uh, with Sharvi's uh, uh, at a main contribution on the generative uh, aspect of it. Okay, so that's the, the goal of this talk is actually to get some, well, I hope I can give you some guidance on how to develop uh, group equivalent architectures in an intuitive, uh, simple way. And that, that will be the goal of this talk. So the content is, I'll give some context about group equivalent deep learning. Um, and really all that I'm going to present is convolutions and different flavors of it. But now convolutions not on your regular Euclidean space, but on homogeneous spaces of, uh, of a group. And I'll talk briefly about what that means without going into too much technical detail, because I don't think it's necessary or everything is, should remain pretty intuitive. Um, and then I want to end basically this whole story with, well, why do we care about positional orientation space? And actually I was thinking, Maybe I'll start off with this, <laughs> jump straight to the end. Um, okay, no, sorry, I first do this. Okay, uh, context, group equivalent deep learning. So why do we care about group equivalent deep learning? It's because many of the tasks that we uh, work on require these guarantees of invariance or equivalence, right? If you, um, but there's no mouse, right? But at the top left, you see medical images like histopathology slides and you want to make diagnoses or recognize pathological cells regardless of their orientation. So this really is a strictly invariant uh, problem. Uh, the top one in the middle, that's like an embody system, interacting particles, they attract uh, or repulse each other. Um, you know, and that task, the physics um, have, well, required that, um, well, we need to handle equivalence in a proper way. Same for molecular property prediction. Um, but then also equivalent deep learning is also about weight sharing, like building neural networks that are um, equivalent. That means that you are capable of recognizing structures, even if they are transformed under a, a particular group. And this introduces a notion of weight sharing that makes that these networks are very much data efficient because they don't need to learn how to detect an object, for example, on, in the left of the side of the image or on the right side of the image. And there's another motivation for group theory, and that's this notion of hierarchical representations or basically building things up out of lower level components. So that's the, uh, the bottom middle uh, image. Like if you have parts and we put them in a particular configuration, it forms a object like surfaces. If you round them up in a particular way, it forms a tube. And if you line out the tubes in a particular way, you get a bifurcation. And group theory is all about 
relative positioning or relative trans transformation of a uh, standard pose relative to something else. And then the final uh, bit is about, well, symmetries, right? Symmetries um, are in some way um, an, an efficient way of representing stuff. If you uh, know how to maintain an organism or like this, this plant at a, cell, at, at a small level and we use the same kind of symmetries or uh, mechanisms throughout, uh, yeah, then this is definitely a very efficient way of representing uh, well systems. Um, so um, the computer vision, vision field made huge leaps forward, um, well, a huge leap forward with the introduction of these convolutional neural networks, right? And it's actually precisely because of this equivariance. And, you know, as just showed, equivariance is like if the input translates, the output translates accordingly. And this allows for weight sharing, as, as just uh, mentioned. And just to recap and stress on the importance of equivalence again. So it really says that no information is lost when the input is transformed. It's just moved to different locations in space. And, you know, uh, no, uh, okay, that, that's, that's, I think, a very important one. And um, if we stick to this principle of equivalence, we are able to preserve the structure of uh, data, like an image remains of image type, and therefore we can keep on doing trans, uh, like convolutions. Um, and what we do with group convolutions or group equivariant deep learning, we want to generalize this notion of translation equivariance to other symmetries, right? So we do not only want to weight share over positions. With that, I mean, if I'm capable of detecting an edge in one location, I can also detect the same edge in a different location. But also over, for example, rotations. If I detect an edge at this orientation, I could also do it in this orientation. So I don't have to relearn all these different instances of an edge, right? So I, if I'm able to um, build neural networks that are equivalent beyond translations, I get more and more weight sharing and more uh, efficiency. So it's precisely this notion of weight sharing, which I will focus on uh, in this talk. Uh, finally, like, However you approach this group equivalent deep learning field, uh, one common strategy is um, just from first principles, we just say, okay, we want to be equivalent, and then let's see what is left, what can we do? And so for, with, with that lens, um, you can think of convolutional neural networks as a subset of neural networks, right? So you can uh, flatten an image, pass it through a multi-layer perceptron, and you know it could also make predictions, but once you apply a fully connected layer to an image, the complete image structure gets destroyed, right? You scramble everything up. So what you can do, you can constrain these matrix the matrices such that they become convolutions and such that the operation is equivalent and the image structure is preserved. And then you get the convolution layer. So CNNs are a subset of neural networks. And in the same mindset, a group convolutional neural network, so layers that are equivalent not only to translations, but also rotations or scale or whatever, those are further narrowed down set of neural networks. And so this explains also the success of working with symmetries from a different angle, because before it was like, okay, we have more weight sharing and it's a nice inductive bias, but now it's different. If you think of neural networks spanning an incredibly large space of functions that you could possibly fit to your data, uh, so that also means, well, you're easily overfit, right? Uh, one of these neural, many neural networks could fit on the training data, but you want the neural networks that you obtain to be sensible. We want them to respect certain symmetries. So if we reduce the search space to only the equivalent neural networks, um, we have a better chance of generalization, right? So um, that's also a different angle to it. So if we fit um, equivalent neural networks, we reduce our search space to well, the ones that we know at least generalized over uh, well uh, the transformations. Um, you can prove this actually, like this expressivity generalization um, uh, capabilities. And one of the, the common theorems, uh, uh, Taco Cohen started this actually, uh, well, calling this theorem, the, the group convolution is all you need theorem or convolution is all you need. And the team says uh, that if you want if you want a linear layer and we want it to be equivalent, then it has to be a group convolution. There's no other way, right? So equivalent is all about group convolutions. And I'll 
talk a lot about that in, in the upcoming uh, uh, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, so, okay, actually, before I go to convolutions, I just want to get you motivated for where we're heading. Um, so this paper, if we go to the title slide, it says like fast expressive activated networks to rate sharing in position orientation space. And I just want to um, go ahead and mention like, why do we care about position orientation space? Um, it's actually quite common in many applications. So first of all, if you look at molecules, they are typically processed as atomic point clouds in 3D space. But you could also think of a, a molecule as a point cloud of edges, and each edge has a starting point and a direction. Uh, so that defines uh, a position and an orientation. So you can also think of the cloud of edges or covalent bonds as a point cloud in um, position orientation space. Um, if you do pose analysis for action recognition, for example, you can either look at these joints. So these are point clouds in R3. We can look at the limbs, like uh, the, the arm segments. So that, you know, they, they have a certain uh, joint location and the direction in which it points. And um, so if you also incorporate this directional information, well, you get more information that you're, uh, 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 you know, to, to work with. Um, so this is one instance. Another thing is not necessarily a point cloud in position orientation space, but you know, in SE3, right? I, I guess your group is pretty familiar with this, like uh, robot state spaces can be thought of as, um, you know, uh, multiple states in SE3. Um, in protein analysis, um, quite often you coarse grain the entire sequence of amino acids as a sequence of SE3 frames, like an amino acid is somewhere located in space and points in a certain direction. And finally, this is, I'm pretty excited about this part, uh, is generative modeling for uh, in position space. Um, so this is, uh, so, so for in this task, for example, in denoising diffusion models, which we uh, did in the paper, you randomly initialize a set of coordinates and then, you know, you denoise them. So you want to predict displacement factors for each point such that in the end, what comes out is a, is a realistic uh, molecule. And this requires an equivalent uh, map, right? A point cloud is input and predicting vectors uh, as outputs. Um, yeah, okay, so that was a, a, you know, a quick um, jump ahead of what I'm going to talk about. Sorry if it's a bit chaotic. Um, and you know, it's partly because <laughs> if I've had a long, long day uh, behind me already. Um, in the meantime, if there are any questions, um, I can quite see you. Yeah, okay, this one. Um, then uh, let, let me know, of course. Okay, well, um, yeah, so I was saying um, a linear map is accurate if and only if it is a group convolution. So let, let's look into this uh, convolution aspect. And this is all pretty, it should be pretty familiar to all of you. Like, right, if we have an image on the left and we have a certain pattern that we want to pick up on an important feature, a convolution just does this template matching, right? We have a kernel, we scan it over the entire image, and whenever we have a match of this template or this kernel, you know, you get a high response or an activation. Okay. Um, but what if you have multiple patterns that, you know, are rotated copies of each other that are useful to, to learn um, or to work with? Then what this neural network does, it needs to learn a new kernel, right? And then again, do this convolution or, you know, this is parallelized. Of course, you have a whole stack of patterns that you match again. Um, so this is one aspect of it. If we go back to the previous um, one, okay, it's, uh, I made an animation, so we have to wait for it to finish. But what you see in this image, right? You have two of these patterns in the image and, they're shifted at different locations. And because our convolution does this template matching for all possible translations of the kernel, you know, this, this guarantees that you will pick up this pattern, uh, at, you know, even if it's shifted to arbitrary locations. Okay, so this is, uh, should be pr pretty familiar. Um, well, if you have a rotated instance of this, uh, well, you, then you don't necessarily have to guarantee and you have to learn uh, the filter. 
So if you want to be also rotation invariant or equivariant, well, then you can make sure that your kernel has the symmetry to it, right? And because now this block does not quite fit this, this L shape or this particular shape, you might still pick, pick it up, uh, you know, detect it at all these different orientations and all these different locations, but you're not that susceptible to it. For example, in this case, it would respond quite high to the actual uh, circular pattern. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that translational convolutions um, they are not necessarily rotation equivariant, but if you constrain the kernel, then they are, or they can be, right? So if you constrain the kernels to be isotropic. Now, uh, the group convolution concept, let's just quickly reiterate it or introduce it for those that haven't seen it. So you have this kernel, uh, you translate it over the image, then you rotate it, do it again, rotate it, do it again, and every time there's a match, well, you get a higher response. So, what you're doing in contrast to conventional convolution is that now instead of only translating the kernel over the image, you also rotate it and then translate it. So basically you fill out a feature map that is no longer two-dimensional, but it's three-dimensional, right? You also keep, you not only keep track of the template hits for every translation, but also for every rotation. And this is really very intuitively the extension of convolution to group convolutions. Where um, actually, this space of translations and rotations that forms a, a group. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about group theory that much, but it's all about okay this intuitive notion of template matching by transforming uh, a kernel and matching it uh, in your uh, input data. Um, yeah. So what's happening here is that um, at each location. X, we now have a grid of orientations, right? So that's these blue lines and the dots. So the dots represent a particular orientation at that location. And what you see that um, is that, well, uh, a feature gets picked up at all these locations. And if the feature is rotated, it's still picked up in the same uh, neural network. So no information is lost if the input is rotated. It's just shifted to a different location in space. Right, this is this preservation of information that, that I find very important. It's it's here highlighted with these light blue uh, dots uh, as opposed to the dark uh, blue dots. Um, yeah, so a rotation really means a shift or a permutation in your feature map. Okay, so um, equivariance is weight sharing, sharing uh, the same template over all these transformations, and it guarantees that no information gets lost. It's just moved to different locations in the feature map. And this allows your neural network to be robust against transformations. It's just, yeah, uh, like, like a trans translated image, the output just permutes to different locations. And if you consistently apply these transformation laws, um, yeah, then you have this guarantee of equivalence. So as a recap of this particular part is, we are quite used to working with uh, 2D convolutions and those, are maps from a two-dimensional feature map to a two-dimensional output uh, activation map or feature map. Um, and if we don't care about rotations, this kernel can be unconstrained. If we want to be equivalent to both rotations and translations, then we can still work with these 2D feature maps, but then the kernel needs a constraint. It has to be this isotropic kernel. Um, yeah, but if you want no constraints, so we have a fully expressive neural network, then what we need to do is simply um, match the kernel under all rotations, all, all, all translations and rotations. So basically add an extra access to our uh, feature maps. So then we generate these two-dimensional feature maps, and that's the most expressive equivariant map that you can get. Um, so what I want to do next, I want to zoom in a bit on this notion of weight sharing. Because in, for 2D images, it's pretty intuitive, but I want to extend this notion to a bit more abstract settings like these uh, point clouds and position orientation space or uh, robotic arm uh, state spaces. So what's convolution? And now I'm sorry that I wrote convolution because, well, actually this is convolution, but typically we, we, uh, we mix up the terminology cross-correlation and convolution. Um, 
okay, let's so, so let's just use the convolution for all of this for this entire class of operators. So what's happening if I have my input feature map at layer L, that's a superscript L, and I want to find the next feature value at index I, so at that pixel location I, what I'm going to do, I am going to aggregate the feature information of my neighbors. So I'm going to index my neighbors with J, and I'm going to linearly transform that neighboring feature vector with this W, a capital W at matrix. And for every neighbor, I have this matrix vector multiplication. Um, okay, so that's the, basically this is a linear uh, operator that you see over here, but it becomes a convolution if I do this weight sharing, right? If I am going to treat every neighbor pair that I consider equivalent in the same way. Right? So what I'm saying, if I'm at, at the top at I prime, I want to find the feature value for I prime, I'm using the same type of uh, transformation. So these weights, WIJ and WI prime and J prime, they should be the same um, because I think these neighbors are the same. Uh, this actually means that I need to define when are two neighboring pairs equivalent. So, right, and that's the main notion of the paper that, that they got accepted that I clear this notion of weight sharing over equivalence classes. And in this case, we talk about neighbor pairs that we consider to be equivalent. So, in order to, to formally define what we mean with equivalence of point pairs, um, we need to realize that with every pixel index with an i or with a j we have an associated coordinate um okay let's note here with x i and x j and we say that the coordinate that it, that it lives in a homogeneous space of a group g um so this is one of the the few technicalities that i uh, will introduce like a homogeneous space of a group is really a space on which we can let the group act. So uh, a group, like a transformation group, can transform objects. It can transform objects in the space X in such a way that every X can be reached from an arbitrary origin. So let's put at the top left this X naught to be the origin. And I can move that point around to reach any other point in my space. It's a homogeneous space. And this is an important property because well, if we do things like convolutions, then we want to be able to slide this kernel over our, our entire space. And basically saying that our space is a homogeneous space of the group means that we can reach every point. Uh, so we can do template matching over the entire space. Okay, so for every point there exists a group element that connects one point to the other. So now we say two neighbor pairs are called equivalent. Uh, if they're exists a group action such that both points are mapped exactly on top of each other, right? That's, uh, so there's some uh, pink uh, group element that maps uh, you know, the one neighbor pair to the other neighbor pair. And we use a notation like the square bracket to denote the equivalence class of the point pairs that are all equivalent uh, under this um, definition. So if you look at all these neighbor pairs in blue, those are all equivalent, right? It's all saying like my neighbor comes from the top left of my current location. Okay, so and so and the goal then will be we want to do weight sharing over these equivalence classes. So that's what we're uh, uh, working up to. Now, this is the top left, but I could also have a neighbor from the top right here in red, right? That's a different equivalence class. So I, I color coded here in red. So. All these pairs of points, um, they can be equivalent if I can map them to one another. But if I cannot find a group action, like a translation, I cannot just translate the red point pair to one of the blue point pairs. So they live in different equivalence classes, right? So I call it them in blue and red. There's a different uh, equivalence classes. But this is only for the translation group. Now, if I want to be do weight sharing over rotations and translations, then I can map the red to the to the blue, right? By just a rotation and, and possibly a shift. So in this case, all these neighbor pairs, they form, uh, they fall in the same equivalence class because they can rotate translate them over at, from one to the other. 
And um, so, Eric, can I? Yeah, yeah. How does it, how, do, how does it differ to an orbit that uh, acts on the pair with the same group element? Um, it, it's if you would define like something in uh, R six in uh, R six, and you yeah. would have let's say a block diagonal matrix in front of them. Yeah, that so it's, be... it's, uh, you you you're right, and this is um, what I show. If you have a homogeneous space, such as R two in this case, and the group action is SC two, then I can represent every point with multiple group actions, um, and Okay, so, so I'm trying to reproduce what, what I wrote in, in the paper, but what, what I'm showing here is that you can describe indeed a, a tuple of points um, with an orbit in the same homogeneous space. And, and you're correct. So that's, you have like a, a displacement, like a, the, this red and blue displacement factors for a point. But if I also want to be rotation invariant, then you still have one degree of freedom left, like the rotation on this displacement factor. And that acts on the left, left of this displacement factor. And it generates an orbit. Um, yeah, you cannot, cannot draw it right now, but that indeed generates an orbit of this, this point pair. And then okay. the quest is find an identifier for this orbit in the homogeneous space. And that, that's actually the route that I took in, in the paper. Like if you want to, come up with an identifier for the equivalence class of point pairs. We're actually looking for um, an identifier for an orbit in, in, uh, in the homogeneous space. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a nice observation. I left it out from the, of this talk, but um, yeah, it's in the paper. And, uh, um, yeah, so conceptually, um, we want to do weight sharing over these equivalence classes. And I just illustrated here, like two point pairs are considered equivalent if I can map them Onto each, onto each other with uh, a rotor translation in this case. Here if, here, if I'm talking about different equivalence classes, it would be the radius, right? The distance from one point to the other, uh, because I cannot rotor translate the, the, the orange pairs onto the green pairs in any way. And right? they're, they're simply like have different distances to each other. Okay, so in terms of a convolution kernel, uh, it will be like this, right? That I have pixels that have, that have the same radii, they map in the same orbit. So they should have the same value. And that is like an explanation, at, well, a different route to explaining that the convolution kernels should be isotropic. Um, and if they are, well, then you're effectively doing weight sharing over neighbors uh, that's, that, that they consider equivalent under a rotor translation. Um, yeah, so back to the convolution form. When we say convolution is actually of this form, it's weight sharing over equivalent point pairs. We're actually saying uh, the convolution kernel should be indexed by their equivalence class. If I have a neighbor, then I just look up, okay, what is the transformation that I apply to this neighboring point pair? Uh, so I have to look up what is the, the, you know, the equivalence class to which this uh, point pair uh, falls into. Um, yeah, so so that's really the idea behind um, weight sharing in, in my uh, point of view. Um, and so we saw this example. If we only have translation equivariance, then actually these equivalence classes are simply identified with the displacement factor. If I have a three by three kernel, there's nine different displacement factors. So this weight, this kernel is actually parameterized by, with nine different weights, which I can simply look up. And that's why weight sharing is quite literally um, the weights that parameterize your neural networks. They are shared over these neighbors. Um, and, well, if you consider that terminology. Um, so what I want to do next is, well, use this notion of uh, weight sharing to, to the more um, um, recent framework of message passing. It's, it's, uh, I'll get back to what, why this is, might be interesting. So. Okay, so I said convolution is essentially having one weight or one transformation matrix W per equivalence class. And in this case, if I talk about rotor translation, equivalence, a set, um, then um, these 
these equivalence classes are identified by the distance, right? And if I have a five by five convolution kernel, I essentially have six different classes. Um, like, yeah, that all denoted the distance of the neighbor to the origin. Um, yeah, so I can still index my weight matrix with just these six numbers. That's all I need to store in my computer. And I can start doing my convolutions. And what comes out if you sample this kernel, this isotropic convolution kernel. But what if you, you know, go to arbitrary data structures like point clouds, then you can in general expect all, all possible distances, right? So if I have my central point xi and I have my neighbor xj and xk, well, xj has a certain distance uh, to well, xi. So that's this orbit that I draw over there. xk has a certain, certain distance, but in general, I can expect all possible distances. And so you can no longer really index your matrix with, well, an infinite amount of indices or like a lookup table of, with in, an infinite amount of entries that's just not feasible. Um, this is a pretty straightforward solution. It's like, um, are we going to index indeed the matrices with an infinite, infinite amount of um, the values? And, and yes, that's what we do, but in a parametric way, right? So if W is a continuous kernel, it just takes as input this distance and spits out a transformation matrix, then we're good. And this is what you would do with continuous kernel convolutions, where W could be, for example, a multi-layer perceptron, or it could be a function expanded in basis functions in a particular way. Um, but this allows us to well, define convolution on these continuous spaces. It's, it's somewhat, somewhat trivial, of course, if you come from this, this background, but I'm just trying to you know, continue the storyline here, starting from this discrete convolution and weight sharing. So, I'm saying here we're doing weight sharing if my convolution kernel is indeed taking as input an identifier for the equivalence class and spits out the transformation matrix. Um, okay, so something went wrong with the um, transitions. Um, so, okay, so what have we seen? So we have the discrete convolution kernel, which really assigns a transformation matrix to each possible equivalence class as an, as an index, as a sort of lookup table. And then we have the continuous kernel convolution where this lookup is parameterized with an MLP or some other continuous function. Um, now, one drawback of, well, it's not a drawback, uh, but one maybe some, some sort of limitation is that what you're essentially doing is a linear transformation of your neighbor uh, F subscript J, right? It's just a matrix factor multiplication. So it's a linear transformation, though this transformation is conditioned on the pairwise attribute or this, uh, this uh, orbit identifier. So if we move to the message passing framework, then we still have this analogy of weight sharing, but now the transformation itself becomes a bit more expressive or, or powerful in that sense, right? Because now I have a transformation of my neighboring feature va vector fj through a message function that says phi sub subscript m. Uh, so a, and, and it's phi subscript n, it could be a multi-layer perceptron or some other nonlinear function, uh, and it spits out a transformed feature value. And so since this function is dependent on both the, the input feature, uh, f subscript i, as well as um, the orbit identifier, um, yeah, this, this could maybe be thought of as a nonlinear convolution. Uh, some, uh, at least it's a nonlinear transformation that still has this um, Sort of notion of weight sharing through conditioning on these uh, orbit identifiers because this means if your phi m is indeed conditioned on these orbit identifiers you mean that every neighboring point pair is transformed in the same way but now it's in a non-linear way where before it was in, in a linear way and yeah then we have these update functions uh, phi u uh, that i wrote there but it's not that important uh, and it's maybe, well, what is important is to stress is indeed that the, the continuous kernel convolution is a specific instance of message passing. Other instances are transformer layers or, um, I don't know, whatever is, uh, is working well uh, in literature. And I'm saying here that all of these layers, you could modify them such that they are guaranteed to have this notion of weight sharing over your uh, equivalence classes by making them dependent on these pairwise attributes. Um, yeah, so that's the final technical bit of this talk. 
is then how do we find these optimal pairwise attributes? It's pretty uh, well known for the, the standard cases, but I want to work with position orientation space uh, for reasons that I started off with and maybe we will revisit in, in a minute. So we already saw that if we have a point cloud in R3 or Rn for that matter, and we want to be SEN equivalent, uh, or we want to do weight sharing over the full rotor translation group, then we need this to have these unique identifiers for these point pairs. And well, in this case, it's really the pairwise distance. And in the paper, uh, I proved that this, well, it's, it's a very simple proof, but that this is the unique identifier for this equivalence class. Um, but when it comes to molecules and other type of data sets, um, now, first of all, this is limiting, right? If I only know the distance and I do message passing to, to, to update my feature values, I don't know where the information came from. Did it come from a side chain in this direction, this direction relative to, well, whatever chain I'm looking at or to the other direction? So this directional information is particularly important in, in molecules and, and many other tasks um, because, I know, you have maybe electrons pulling from one, one side and and flows of electrons in the other direction. And you want you need this directional information. And if you only condition on this invariance, like distances, uh, well, there's no way you're going to figure out this directional stuff or in a very roundabout way, uh, maybe it's possible. Um, so one thing that, that we actually did in the in the paper is, um, well, on the, on the GitHub page, uh, at least I still have to update the paper, is, uh, well, instead of doing you know, a graph neural network on a point cloud, we construct a point cloud in position orientation space by taking all of the edges as the primitives, right? So now each edge has a starting point and an end location. Uh, so a position in R3 and a direction in S2. So we essentially construct a point cloud in position orientation space. And then we do message passing between these local orientations, between these bonds. And that allows you actually to keep track of directional information because this edge points in a certain direction and it's sort of saying, okay, if I know a certain side chain in front of me to the right, um, uh, maybe behind me a bit to the left, there is this, um, I know, some other type of uh, um, motif. And now you can keep track of it. And so in the paper, I, I derive then what are the unique identifiers for this equivalence class of positions and orientations. And it's pretty much literally what I said. The first element is a displacement factor in the direction of my current orientation. The second item is the displacement factor orthogonal to my current orientation, OI. Um, and the last one is the angle that, you know, that the, the, the two orientations make. Um, Yes, so there's three invariants. There's only three invariants to, to obtain. And it's already one more or like two more than what we had in if we stick to position space. If we go to position orientation space, then we can start working with three uh, pairwise invariants. Um, yeah, but we don't necessarily need like covalent bonds in any way because we can always decide to assign to each point a grid of orientations. Just like I did with the group convolutions, like do template matching not only over translation, but also over orientations. We can decide to assign to every position a grid of orientations and then just keep track of information relative to all these orientations. And if you do this dense enough, you, well, with all these grid based methods, you're always equivalent up to the resolution of the grid. And it's the same here, right? So the denser the grid, the more accurate you are in localizing directional information. Um, yeah, and just going back to what I started off with, if you do group convolutions, you do also this template matching over positions. So you do template matching over the atoms, but then at each atom or at each position, you're going to keep track of um, the direction that information came from, right? So you construct this, this blue fibers, and it's quite literally a fiber bundle that we're um, in the mathematical sense that we're constructing here. We're keeping track of directional information at each location via a grid. So that's these blue uh, lines. And in this case, it's these, um, well, a pinwheel uh, type uh, uh, figures. OK, so we're essentially, we're extending the domain such that we can, um, yeah, so, such that we have less constraint, right? But because a constraint is my kernel has to depend only on this distance. 
an invariant. So that's like a really a constraint operator. But in this case, we have less constraint because now we can condition it on three of these invariants. Um, if I were to construct a point cloud over SE3, the full group, then there wouldn't be any constraints. And this is something like a middle ground between doing group convolutions over position space versus full-blown group convolutions over SE3, uh, if you do this on position orientation space. Um, yeah, so yeah, so this is the, the figure that we had in the paper. Like if you do this, if you assign like a spherical grid to each point, um, and you do this by sharing this grid over all your atoms, then you can uh, implement a separable group convolution. So you do so you can make it super efficient by only doing spatial interactions, just like you would usually do. Then do a very efficient point-wise group convolution over the sphere, and then you can do channel interactions. And um, you know if you share the spatial interactions, which are the most expensive part of of message passing or point cloud methods, because you have all these different type of neighbors. If you um, separate that over the the orientations and the channels, then this can be well. Then you only need a few operations. So that's the most expensive part. You reduce it to well uh, the best thing you can, and then all the rest, like spherical convolutions and channel interactions, those are pointwise operations, and they're easily parallelized. Um, so that's one one application of this. If you assign a grid per point, then you can do the separable implementation of convolution. Now, one of the main results of the, the paper, which really isn't that impressive, because <laughs> I must say, because it's pretty obvious, like what are the invariants? But what I really find important is that we really show that the attributes that we find are indeed complete and unique. So that's why this bijective uh, thing, I underline it here. Meaning if uh, I want to do weight sharing over position orientation space, I want to be maximally expressive. So I really want to make sure that points that are equivalent, point pairs are equivalent, that they receive the same identifier, um, but also that each identifier is unique for that equivalence class. Um, for example, you could come up with a trivial identifier of like assigning the value zero to every point pair. Then at least every point in the equivalence class receives the same identifier, just the number zero. But the zero is not unique. It's it's uh, you know representing everything, so that's very useless. Um, so basically, what this theorem says that if you work with point clouds over position space, position orientation space, or the full group then these are all the invariants that you need. And uh, for example, equation 10, that's really just the, the relative group action that you see there. Maybe you recognize it there. And that's a six dimensional uh, thing. And so if you do full group convolutions uh, on SE3, then you get six invariants. But if you want to do group convolutions on position orientation space, then, well, then you can only use three invariants. And if you want to do equivalent convolutions on position space, then you only get one invariant. So there's sort of a hierarchy in, in expressivity. But what I'm also showing is um, that um, if you build group convolutional networks or graph neural networks uh, conditioned on these attributes, then they are universal approximators of equivalent maps. So in some sense, there's no need to go to a space larger than position orientation space. Uh, from R3S2 to SE3, for example, it's not a necessary, you, you don't gain much by doing so. Whereas if you stick to position oriented space, you're, you're very much uh, efficient. So I have some statements about it in, in the paper. So yeah, this is actually what I moved to at the start. So why position orientation space? Well, I just showed, and this is relying on um, uh, the paper by Din and Maron, um, uh, I believe, and, and others uh, like the there's results on universal approximation power of equivariant neural networks, but they're typically focusing on these tensor field type networks. And basically, what I do in the appendix of our paper is show that if you have spherical signals per point, you can do a pointwise Fourier transform and obtain or, or like uh, irreducible representation or tensor field type neural network. Well, so it shows that there's this equivalence between this type of 
group regular group convolution type neural network and the tensor field network. So they're in some way the same. It's just that this is based on the grid on uh, orientations and the other are based on free A type representations. But effectively they are the same and therefore they also have the same approximation power. So if you just use these invariants, then you don't compromise on expressivity. That's the, the take home uh, here. Yeah, and then, then I was saying, okay, um, well, we apply this for uh, a chemical property prediction. And we do see a clear hierarchy also in results. Like I said, if I work on position space, I can only use distances and that's less expressive. And we, we see that if we switch to position or in day space, you get a huge boost in uh, performance on, for example, energy prediction or molecular property prediction. Um, yeah, we also use this for embody simulation uh, data, where we want to predict forces or like uh, velocity factors per point. Um, we didn't do this actually, but I wanted to show it as, as an application area for position orientation space uh, stuff. Robot, robot robotics I already showed. Um, I think this is a pro promising area where we have point clouds over SE3. Um, well, you end up doing group convolutions over uh, point clouds. And this is a nice um, application area. Um, yeah, which I think is, is very promising. A lot of degenerative models, they require de denoising uh, or predicting displacement factors, denoising directions, and that just requires equivariance, right? Um, because there's no a priori orientation of a molecule that, that you uh, generate. Maybe for some shapes uh, it is, if you have like a, you know, <laughs> like a, a model net, for example, has pretty well aligned uh, uh, shape structures. Um, yeah, and then, then there's one final detail that I didn't explain is how do we predict vectors? And if you have this grid-based approach, if you have like a grid of orientations assigned to each position, and uh, so you build up this feature map for each position and orientations, then you can make also a point-wise uh, prediction via this, this sum. You just make a weighted sum of your grid orientations, right? So VI is your predicted velocity or this displacement factor and it's a weighted sum of your grid elements weighted with you know whatever your activation map uh, learned um, well whatever it obtained so going one step further this is like a um, um, free a bit like a free transform where you predict project on spherical harmonics of order one those are your direction uh, factors and since we have a spherical signal, we can decompose the spherical signal into its Fourier components of different frequencies. So just like the tensor field networks, if our neural network requires to predict tensors of order frequency of order order, or we can also do it with this method by doing pointwise Fourier transforms. And that's, um, I am not going to expand further on that in, in this talk, but just to, to know we're actually dealing with pointwise spherical signals and from spherical signals you can do well, your harmonic analysis to obtain whatever object um, or equivalent object you, you want to get out of it. So we use it here for vector prediction, but in principle, you could also predict uh, tensors uh, like diffusion matrices. But uh, Eric, even for scalars, uh, uh, I mean, you showed uh, the, the AIJs, but uh, how would you sample the SO3 uh, to, who still needs spherical harmonics, right? It's not only for tensors. Um, yeah, so um, it's a bit like if you have your SO3 Fourier coefficients. Okay, let, let's put it like this. Um, the Fourier coefficients transform via Wigner D matrices. Um, and this, so do the spherical harmonics. And we have like a spherical signal, so we can only get spherical harmonics out of it. But like one frequency component on SO3 consists of, well, uh, two L plus one vectors of length two L plus one. And so, we, and if I do a spherical Fourier transform, I per frequency only get one vector of, of length two L plus one. And so one trick that could be done here is if you want to predict like a three by three matrix, which is the first frequency component or the first Wigner D matrix, you could generate your neural network 
and let your neural network generate three different spherical signals and take three mm -hmm. spherical Fourier transform of it, and it gives you three of these factors, and you can combine them together to. Okay. Well, and then you define that to be like your ring D matrix or your uh, SO3 uh, thing. Because each of these signals could represent like one direction and then the other orthogonal direction and the other signal, the other orthogonal direction. Um, yeah. So that's way to, yeah, to utilize this position orientation space thing to parameterize full SC3 uh, signals. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, that, that's it. I, I didn't want to abruptly end this talk with uh, a thank you. So I just <laughs> like revisiting what we have seen. So I gave a motivation for this equivalent deep learning. I think you, your group knows very well, like the use cases for this. Um, but what I want to push through is this viewpoint of convolution and convolution is all you need actually, because all of these applications that we addressed in the paper, we only did convolution. We actually didn't do more advanced message, message passing stuff. And so I still think even on these 3D point clouds and 3D cases, convolution is still all you need. People are looking for different types of architectures, but the, the ConvNet architecture of just doing like a linear convolution then and a pointwise activation function and keep doing that gives you all the expressivity you, you would need in principle. And um, yeah, and why is now this convolution frame more useful? Because if you stick to the tensor field uh, framework, then the recipe changes a little bit. Because you do have your linear Klebsch Gordon operators, but then as pointwise activation functions or nonlinearities, you cannot just use ReLUs or whatever. You have to use specialized activation functions that preserve the tensor uh, structure. And, and so translating all the results of deep convolutional neural networks to the 3D case is not straightforward in this tensor field case. Actually, it doesn't work like that. Um, and in this framework, if you say, okay, we just work with scalar fields over homogeneous spaces, then you can just stick to your radio activation functions and don't have to think about anything at all. Like what can I use or what can I not use if you just stick to the attributes that I presented in this, uh, in this talk. So I think that simplifies your life as an AI engineer quite a bit, I think. Uh, just make sure that you condition everything you can on these pairwise attributes, and then you should be good. Um, yeah, so so that, that's it. <laughs> that's my message. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, so we have five minutes left. Um, um, yeah, but, but if there's interest, but maybe we can do that after this. We can also check out the repository and, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm open for questions and thank you very much for uh, listening. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure we all really enjoyed it. Um, so folks, if you have questions, feel free to jump in. Uh, is there anything to account for like similarity of a scale? So I understand that you're going through translational and uh, rotational. I might have missed if you mentioned something about scale. Yeah, so th there's been work on scale equivalence. Um, so I put this slide up, but this is already like a couple of years old. And even back then, I, I probably missed out on several important uh, milestone papers. Um, but if you look at the league group stuff at the, at the bottom right, um, the theory quite easily generalizes to all sorts of groups. But really, the, the challenge is in the implementations, and especially for scale equivalence. Um, yeah. like. Compact groups are easy, like rotations in that sense, because you never leave your domain of, of, of the group. But if you have a scale there, then you need to decide what is the minimal scale and what's the maximum scale. And scale equivalents really, or equivalents really requires you to keep track of all possible scales and relative scales as well. And, and that's a challenge. Um, but just like with translation convolutions, uh, an image is always has a finite amount of pixels, right? So you cannot translate it beyond what it is. Uh, so you do zero padding, for example, and, and the same you can do for the poor scale axis. Um, but yeah, so that is works so on that, that handle scale equivalence. Uh, it's just like um, they're a bit harder in some sense to to implement. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yes. Uh... Yes, uh, uh, thank you for staying so late, uh, Eric. That was a really a beautiful talk. Uh, 
Can you relate uh, what you had done here with the gauge equivariance when you have a graph convolution that you really have to choose locally an origin? I see. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I need a gauge equivariance. Um, so actually, I mentioned something like this these things as, as feature fields. And it's quite literally directly fits in this gauge equivalence framework where you have at each position, so a field over a base domain, right? And the base domain is now position space, but now at each position you attach a fiber of orientations. And on this fiber, you have a group act a rotation action defined. So I know how to rotate these spherical signals. And that's the main principle behind uh, fiber bundle methods is that you have a field of fibers and each fibers you have a rotation action or some group action defined. It's the same here. And now I have a field of spherical signals. Now, where does the gauge equivalence come in? It's when you don't have a well-defined reference orientation um, because these spherical signals could be defined in different bases. So you need a change of bases if you map one to the other. But in our case, because we talk about point clouds over an Euclidean space, there's no need to work with gauge equivalence because I can just define a global reference frame. But um, yeah, like this, in a 2D plane, just like in a 2D plane, I can assign like just one axis of orientations, like orientation aligned with the x-axis, axis, one orientation aligned with the y-axis, one with the negative x-axis one with the negative y-axis, so four reference orientations, for example. And they're all defined relative to this global axis system, a coordinate system. It's the same in 3D. You can construct a grid relative to a global coordinate system. But if you were to do this type of Google convolutions over a shape, like a surface, yeah, then you cannot define a globally consistent coordinate system. So I'm talking about that like a 2D shapes embedded in 3D. Um, yeah, and then you do need this gauge transformation. Then you need to know how to how one of these blue fibers relates to the other blue fibers by a coordinate change. Um, yeah, so so if you would come up with an example of a fiber bundle on R three, I don't I don't know really don't know what what it means, but like like this two D sheet that you see over here, you can easily fold it into a three D geometry like a shape, uh, and then you need gauge theory. I don't know what, what it means for, for the 3D case, but in principle, yeah, the, the same principles apply here that you could define a reference frame per fiber because well, uh, we know how these things rotate relative to uh, the, the coordinate system. And do you have any ideas about uh, covariant on linearities? I mean, this was the, okay, this is, comes on top of the linear map. Uh, I mean, what do, uh, what do you apply, for example, in your paper, in, in this paper or other papers of yours? So sorry, come I didn't uh, hear your first uh, question. But equivariant nonlinearity, like uh, in equivariant, when you don't have a scalar and you have as an output a vector or a higher dimensional tensor, what do you usually apply as an equivariant nonlinearity? Oh, um, like in, in these networks, uh, we just use this ReLU actually, because we actually have, we only work with invariants, like the pairwise attributes are invariant, the scalar, uh -huh. all the feature maps are invariant. And that's the, the one of the main, uh, maybe I didn't sell it, it enough, but like in our case, we don't have to think about specialized activation functions because we just have signals, scalar signals over a domain. Uh, uh -huh. space. Yeah. So, so we're not limited in, in, in that respect. And, and I like that because, yeah, as said, with tensor field networks, you have to take all these intricacies uh, into account. And I hear you don't. Okay, I have one question. Uh, is there any smaller relief, any smaller space than the R3 crosses to something, for example, like R3 crosses O2, which is also homogeneous, that could also be universal approximator? Um, yeah, let's see. I, I don't think it's, um, I, I don't think it's, it's that well defined because it's not a homogeneous 
No, it is a homogeneous space. That there's something off here, right? Because if you have only SR2 uh, and you do out of plane rotations, you leave that initial rotation plane, right? So I feel like. Um, yeah, but in the end, the universal approximator is for functions in the original space, right? In R3. Yeah, okay. So, so what your question, I'm just thinking like, what would it mean? Like R3 times uh, SO2, for example. Um, I think you, okay, I think the same approximation theory methods apply. It's just that you're no longer fully SE3 equivalent because if you pick SO2, um, then you only consider like, for example, in the XY plane rotations, you can only keep track of that unless you use gauge theory indeed. And this is an example maybe where you could use gauge theory if you're able to predict at each position a reference orientation and then only relative to that reference orientation you consider SO2 rotations. This would indeed establish like a gauge field of to every voxel a reference factor and then you only consider representations orthogonal or rotations orthogonal to it. Uh, that would actually be interesting use cases actually to uh, if you have like a well-defined way of constructing gauges, then you can indeed reduce your, uh, yeah, your symmetry groups. Is the challenge there that there's like, there's not a, like R3 cross SO2 is not at the quotient of some subgroup of SE3? Yeah, I think, um, um, Yeah, no, no, I think that that's the issue, right? Like um, in the paper, I only considered quotients groups of, of, of quotients uh, spaces of SE3 slash, and then indeed like a compact subgroup. And then, um, yeah, sorry, I, I cannot quite uh, point out what is the problem with this construction of R3 times uh, S, uh, SO2. Um, Yeah, I guess it's just not closed under the the, the full S E three group action in this space because it need if you do a rotation out of plane then well what happens? Uh, so there's something not well defined in this setting. Yeah. Yeah, we don't even think about the the same SO two. For example, you can build an SO two as you said as a gauge from the input. You can an adaptive SO two for each. Yeah. The point of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So so I do think like working with gauges that's a, that's a solution to this. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So, like, uh, I'm curious. Uh, a lot of the examples you, you used drew from, you know, things more oriented towards perception. For example, uh, not exclusively, but I'm curious if you think, you know, especially some of these point cloud methods make me think of sort of control of multi agent systems or other applications like that uh, that are more oriented towards like action and control. And I'm just curious if you can say anything more about how you think these kinds of methods might apply there as well. Yeah, um, I think like. Before this, um, there's these methods on Lie group convolutional methods, and they it's just like a continuous kernel convolution, but then the kernels are conditioned on, well, the relative group action, and then the the logarithm, the the Lie group logarithm of this, and so you you map like a relative group element yeah. to the Lie algebra, yeah, and that's like like a vector space that that could that actually indicate what action should I take if I want to move this point to the other, right? If I follow the forward motion and the, 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 the torque and, and this, this kind of motion. So uh, in that sense, the convolution kernels are defined in the Lie algebra, basically um, saying something like, how does one element relate to the other via the generators? And yeah, so but, but this is just maybe one thing that comes up uh, following your, your question, like um, how does this fit in this control theory perspective? Maybe initially only about how to relate objects to each other via these kind of uh, exponential maps. Um, but yeah, if you work with these point clouds in, in, in groups, then you could, in principle, indeed, also predict, um, yeah, like like um, Lie algebra elements or like generators. And yeah. so now I predict vectors. But if you have a point in the neighboring group elements, you could also predict, indeed, and each neighboring element defines a tangent factor in the Lie algebra. Then you could, in principle, also construct ways of predicting 
via linear combinations of these tangent elements, new tangent vectors. Um, so I don't think it needs to be that complicated, actually. But, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think once you define your feature maps over the group, then you can also start talking about predicting uh, generators and uh, things in the league algebra. Makes sense. Thanks. Other questions? And in terms of deep learning, have you been like a deep architecture and have you seen like if it's favorable uh, during training, lifting the space into position orientation? Yeah, so, so your question is? So... Uh, if uh, you have uh, trained a uh, deep uh, architecture using this layer, and if there's any like a uh, favorable property, like a uh, fast training or something else. I see. Uh... Yeah, um... Memory, for example. um... Well, it, it definitely takes more, uh, consumes more memory because now we uh, assign like a fiber of orientations to each point. Um, I guess it, we didn't really see significant, well, actually there is, right? This, um, the generative uh, models, right? For molecules, there we actually saw uh, a big difference. Like the baseline was EGNN, which is an equivalent method, but it only works on these invariants, on these di pairwise distances. Right, and you can imagine that if you want to construct or generate a molecule, you want to put the, the, all the atoms at the right places. Right, if I have like a side in here, then another side in should be a bit to the left, and that the direction. So this directional information is important. So even though there are methods that are fully equivalent, but they're only based on these invariants and thus have these constraint operators. Uh, so they're still equivalent, but they're constrained. They they are able to generate molecules, and we saw that. With fewer epochs, we could generate more realistic samples than these, these invariant uh, uh, methods. Um, so I was just thinking, like in general, if you look at computer vision, if you have a limited number of data samples, then actually you want, in order to generalize, maybe you want to constrain your model, and that would maybe means okay, we constrain it to be equivariant. But then, if you constrain it to be equivariant. And then you could pick uh, either the isotropic kernels or the fully expressive group convolution uh, flavor. Actually, both would have the same kind of dynamics, except that the, the group convolution stuff are more expressive. Um, yeah, so, so OK, yeah, so, so actually taking it back to the generation of molecules there, we did see a big difference, actually, in, uh, in like how these methods uh, converge. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's simply because they're more expressive uh, that they also quicker learn with also reach higher performances. And we also saw this for energy prediction of molecules, for example. If you only use pairwise distances, you can get quite far. But if you do this in a fully uh, non-constrained method, um, yeah, then, then you just get uh, like great performance. But it's not like we, we had to change anything about the optimizer settings or all of these stuff. It's really like a flag in the code. Like, are we going to do this on position space or position orientation space? And then you use the same hyperparameter stuff. Uh, yeah. I would like to thank Eric for uh, also publishing his lectures. I mean, you have done a great service to the community. This is really yeah, like thank you so much. The, the, the resource for equivariance these days. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I have learned from others as well, right? And uh, and apart from that, it also gives me this visibility, right? Uh, to to be to ending up uh, presenting at your group. So that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, no, but thanks for that. Yeah. Um, maybe I can ask one more question. Yeah. So uh, you, you talk about a lot of things we know how to do really well now, and it, it almost seems as if a lot of these problems have been solved at this point of how do you, you know, make these kinds of things into your uh, process. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about about what you still think is hard, or maybe where you know these things are difficult to implement in practice? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this for me. I'm still continuously working on improving these these type of methods in efficiency. And this was one step because I want to step away from these tensor field uh, methods. Um, and I think we're yeah we're reaching the limits of what's possible in terms of efficiency there. But at the same time, yeah, we see better hardware and stuff. But now I want to focus more on efficiency from the representational perspective. If you think of 
all these big generative models like Midjourney or ChatGPT, they, they're so incredibly expensive. And those methods, because of the training and the incredibly incredible size of these models, it's, I think it's really a destructive paradigm. The scale is all you need uh, argument. So I'm very much against that. And the way to, to solve that is to focus on methods that are uh, really data efficient, that are just smarter. And the first step towards that end is to make sure that these methods are equivalent, right? Because if I want to train uh, something that works well with molecules, then I can train it on millions of molecules such that it finally figures out equivalence, or I can just bake equivalence in, into the, the, the system. So one route to more like generalized solutions is well, both discovering and utilizing symmetries at the same time. We have a nice project in this direction, and I really hope that in the next year we can we can publish something on this. Um, but the other thing is representational efficiency. And there I th really think like hierarchical modeling is, is key to this. And we have a paper, like, it's really by Christian Shoemake from uh, um, the Redwood Center of Theoretical Neuroscience in Berkeley. Um, so he has this uh, hierarchical sparse coding um, uh, paper. And I think that is very promising because if you're able to, to model both the part whole hierarchies as well as their deformations, like uh, sort of the shape spaces at the same time, this gives you a lot of representation power because now if you want to detect this hand, you no longer have to completely learn a new hand if it's slightly deformed. You just sort of be able to match it against one, one against the other, right? So that gives a huge boost potentially even like exponential um, gains in a uh, sample complexity. And so I think that's that's the most promising route really that that I would that I envision like this, how to handle hierarchical representations. And, and the final thing is how to compute with geometric primitives, right? If um, if you want to do geometric reasoning or or planning in some way, you have to know or let the computer has to know as long as far as you can talk about it how objects relate to each other, what are the geometric structure of the things that you work with. And now these neural networks, they work with just plain vector representation. The picture you have a plain vector, which, which maybe it could carry geometric information, but, but then, then if you do a plain matrix vector multiplication, all this geometric information gets completely destroyed, right? So pr the preservation of geometric structure through equivalence, for example, that's important, but it doesn't have to be like this steerable or this group convolutional fields. We also see uh, Clifford algebra neural networks that as core computational primitives do not use this Euclidean vectors, but something that carries geometric information. And I, yeah, so, so th those are at least the things that are on my mind, like um, how to build neural networks that are flexible in what kind of stuff they compute with. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Any other? I should let him sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for staying up late to give this talk and answer some questions. Uh, and I'm sure you all really enjoyed it. I definitely did. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Much. All right. Thank you. I just yeah. one last word. Like, uh, I just want to say that um, like the repository is out there. So if you want to try the codes, uh, we want to add some intuitive explainers to, to the code still prior to uh, iClear. Um, but if you if you try it out and you, you struggle with it, feel free to mail me and uh, or my co-authors and then we could help you out with it. Um, but yeah, thanks again for, for having me. It's, uh, it's been great and uh, no problem at all doing this in the evening. It's actually kind of nice and you now I can choose my own drink uh, with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 All right.